My name is Nick Padilla. I'm Penn Russell. Hi, my name is Charlie. Hey, how you doing? Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Russ. Hi, my name is Ben Zabin. My name is Bruce Lee. I go by Speedy or Speed King. I understand, though, that this is a documentary where we want to compare some magic. So it transformed in a different way than I was expecting. Dini, at his time, I think brought in the era of grand illusion. My name is Nick Padilla. I have been a magician for 14 years. When I was six years old, my dad showed me a card trick. And he uh, placed four aces on top of the deck, laid them all out, flipped one of them. All the other aces turned into different cards and they were back in the middle of the deck and it blew my mind and ever since then I always had a thing for magic, it was unexplainable, it was it was amazing. When I was 10 he took me to a magic shop and bought me a couple gimmicks and uh, I liked it but I wasn't really like in love with it and I was 14 I saw Chris Angel on TV and I looked at the TV and I just said that's what I want to do and 14 years later I'm here. Back in the early 1900s you had about three famous people, you had W.C. Fields, you had Charlie Chaplin and you had Harry Houdini. Houdini was born Eric Weiss in Budapest, Hungary, and he immigrated over to America when he was about seven or eight years old, and um, he moved to Harlem in his teen years to New York. Houdini actually wasn't the most skilled magician with his technical ability, but he knew how to put himself out there. He was, a, he was one of the most famous people on the planet. Um, his name, Houdini, is still synonymous with magic today. Houdini at his time, I think, brought in the era of grand illusion. Even the illusionists before him had not done things like make an elephant vanish. That, in the early 1900s, would have been the equivalent of Copperfield making the Statue of Liberty vanish. People's minds were blown. And it was on the largest stage in New York at the Hipperdome. But honestly, as far as old magic to new magic, okay, there's nothing really new in magic. I mean, you have vanishes, levitations, productions, changes. Um, you can do livestock magic. But things like cut and restored rope, you can trace that back 500 years, if a, if a day. Um, the lotta bowl or lota bowl, the never-ending bowl of water, 3,500 years old at least. Day Day did it for the pharaohs. Magic nowadays, um, after Houdini's time, Houdini really um, brought it to the public eye, but after Houdini's time you had a lot of uh, stage illusionists that came up and then a man named Doug Henning was the first, uh, he was the first one to make magic like, he was the rock star of magic in the 1960s, 70s, Doug Henning. And then after that, in the 80s, came David Copperfield. David Copperfield brought magic home through CBS, ABC. He used to have specials every year. He would escape out of straitjackets. He would do flying illusions. He would do some crazy stuff. But it was still via stage. You know, he would do some stuff, some close-up stuff on stage. He would do some close-up stuff for people in the street. But it wasn't until around the 90s that David Blaine aired his first street magic special. I believe it was on TLC. And that was what really brought tricks to the street and made it now a completely different vibe of this cool street magician going out and showing real people tricks that you could get in a magic shop. Um, after that, when the internet exploded, when YouTube first came up, there was like three guys that did magic on YouTube. One's name was Nuts for Magic. I can't even remember the other guys' names, but. You had a few people on the internet doing magic and you know, YouTube came out around the same time that I started doing magic, which was about 14 years ago, 14 years later. 
it's flooded with so much. You could type in the word magic and just watch videos until the day you die. Um, magic nowadays, it's a lot of cards. It's a lot of close up. It's a lot of new, what's out now, what can we do, what can we, you know, but the mark of a true pro, take guys like Shin Lim, Eric Chien, is the ability to take all those different elements and put them together in an act. It hasn't really become an act anymore. It's more of like, here's a trick, check this out. Here's a trick, check this out. Which is a great thing to keep the, the public interest of magic alive is fantastic. Houdini was amazing at getting people into seats. He would have these incredible posters advertising just impossible feats uh, buried alive. He would make elephants disappear. Uh, he would hold his breath for insane amounts of time. Uh, and the magic show itself was, I think, what we would interpret as a very important magic show. He would lock himself up, go behind a curtain for 45 minutes. He would escape from the shackles after 35 seconds and spend the other 44 and a half minutes just reading the paper behind the curtain while the audience and in the house just was sitting there in suspense. He had this, he was the master at building the suspense that guys like David Blaine have put into their shows today. And David Blaine has a touring show where the audience is watching him underwater for I think it's like eight or 10 minutes and it's just insane. Uh, they're just sitting there trying to hold his breath along with David and nobody's succeeding except for, of course, David Blaine, who really just took exactly what Houdini was doing basically 100 years ago and it's still totally relevant and it's still selling out the biggest venues in the country today. So there's this great story of Houdini and how whenever he went over to Europe for one of the first few times, he was trying to get his magic show popular and it wasn't working. There was a lot of competition on the vaudeville circuit, a lot of competition in the theater circuit, and he had to do something to stick out from the audience. So he started doing street shows, street exhibits, uh, with people in England, and he posed this challenge to the police officers where they said, if I can escape from any of the handcuffs that you give me, and he would do this on the street, and it would just draw a ton of people that would just come watch him do this. He would make headlines and then go to sell out a theater. Uh, he would then, in other parts of the country, he was very well known for this, uh, escape from straight jackets above streets over right here in New York City. Uh, and doing these street stunts would generate publicity for him, which turned into ticket sales. David Blaine was doing the exact same thing. He stood in a block of ice here in Times Square. He would be suspended in glass boxes, uh, and that just generated publicity for him. So Houdini was literally just taking a page, sorry, Blaine was just taking a page right out of Houdini's book uh, in order to become the worldwide sensation uh, that they both ended up becoming. When David Blaine introduced the close-up to the world, a lot, of, a lot of people didn't know what that was. Magicians have been doing it for, for, for ages, but he kind of introduced that close-up magic, meaning that you can bar any object and you do it right in front of them. You don't have to have a table, you don't have to have like a, a you know, a hat or anything like that. He just used certain objects meaning uh, and did it right in front of them in the street. So that's the only difference now. There was no too much street magic back then. Everything was more like theater and table wise and sitting down. The very place that ace about right there. Look right here I still have both jacks. So you already know two jacks. So one jack here, you have the ace there, and another jack right here. Yeah. In a split second, it seems like crazy. Happens. Ready? One, two. He actually won this one here. Now you have both jacks, and I have the ace right here. Yeah, no, I have the little quick. But if you square them together, give it a little shake like this, they actually go become. years. My father was, like I said, an illusionist. My dad, he, I didn't know until I was 13. I started magic when I was nine, so it's a little weird thing. I thought that this one trick that my dad did, I just thought, like, oh, maybe it was just this one trick that someone knew, like, make a chord and just behind the ear. But now he did something a little different. He, I was sitting on the couch, and my brothers kept teasing me. I was six years old. And my dad was trying to make me laugh to try to make me feel better. So he comes out with a glass beer bottle and a paper bag. He puts the beer bottle inside the bag. And he goes, where's the, where's the bottle? And he goes, it's a, I go into the bag. He goes, it's gone. I'm like, really? He goes, look, it came back. You didn't really do anything. It just left in the bag. So I'm like, no, you're, you didn't show me that it was empty. So how am I supposed to know? And he goes, you're supposed to trust me. I'm like, okay. And he goes, look, it's gone again. He goes, look, I'll prove it to you. He holds the bag, holding the bottle inside the bag. 
show that it's empty. But in reality, so he's actually obviously holding the bottle through the back. He goes, look, it came back again. Right? I'm like, all right. I don't believe you stuff. He goes, how about this? I won't even hold it with my hand. So he takes it and puts it on his arm. He goes, see, I'm holding it technically, right? He goes, all right, all right, hold it. Cheers. Here's the bottle. He drops it into the bag, and he goes, where is it? He goes, in the bag. He crumbles it up, and the bottle was gone. It was literally that split second that bottle was gone. And when he did that, I was just like, I was freaking out. I didn't know how it worked. Within those 15 minutes that he was showing me magic, I forgot about everything, everything that happened with my brothers teasing me and how stressful my kindergarten school was, uh, everything. I, I forgot about all of it because that moment of entertainment drifted me away from the bad part of my day. That's why I do magic, because I remember that feeling I didn't want. I want to give that feeling on to someone else. Mom and my dad had gotten into an argument, and my mom wanted him to move from the house. My dad was talking to me. My, my mom called the cops on my dad. A restraining order was put, and the cops came. My mom was talking to the cops, whatever, and telling him, oh, he's just, he's just talking to his son, trying to make him feel better, whatever. And I'm like, all right, cool. So the cops, the cops are waiting, and I'm sitting down on the couch. My dad's like, give me your blanket, give me your blanket. And I'm like, OK, why? And he goes, puts it over his head. I'm a, it's a baby blanket. It doesn't really do anything. So it was just covering his head. And he goes, ah, oh, no, it's too small. No, give me the quilt. So I gave him the quilt. He takes off the baby blanket, puts, covers the whole body with his quilt. He's a really short dude. He's like five six. Covers up the, his whole body. The cops walk in. They sit one right here, one right here, one on each side. We're all looking, let's say this, the camera I'm looking at right now is my dad under the blanket. The two people and I are staring dead at my dad. Go, Where's your dad? No clue. They go, you sure? I don't know. They go, what, what's, what's under that blanket right there? And I'm like, it's a lamp. And then you hear my dad sneeze <laughs> under the blanket. And I go, God bless you. He goes, thank you. And they go, lamps don't talk. And I'm like, it's a lamp. The cops walk over and pull the lamp off. I mean, pull the, pull the blanket off, and it wasn't a lamp. I, I literally just named the one thing came to my head. And knowing that I didn't know that my dad was there and I was just lying, killed me. Like, I, I was just in shock. The cops were freaking out because they heard him sneeze. They heard him say thank you. Right after they pulled the blanket off, it was just a lamp there with a camcorder on the bottom. My dad, we lived on the third floor. My dad was downstairs with his bike, rang his bike bell and was like, I'll see you later. And that's it. Two years later, my dad had came back and gave me a deck of cards. He was like, give me a deck of cards. And I, he showed me how to use it. And I performed it to my brother and my brother was like, oh, you're cheating. This is a fake deck. Took him, threw it all over the floor. I didn't know how to fix what I was using. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to practice as much as I need to, to make sure I can give someone that, that feeling. Because obviously I didn't give it to my brother. So I asked my mom, went over to my mom and asked my mom, how long have, uh, uh, how, how long do you work a day? How many hours do you work a day? She goes, uh, I work eight hours a day. She goes, I go, okay, how many days a week? She goes, five days a week. I said, all right, so I'm going to practice magic for eight hours a day, six days a week. That way, I become way better at magic than you are at doing your job. She laughs at me. She goes, is that what you want to do for your rest of life? I'm like, yeah, why not? She goes, OK. So then, walks away. She, I guess she didn't really believe me. And now I'm a 19-year-old loser that still does this. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy. Even if I don't take off and be famous, which I'm going to keep pushing, I'm not going to doubt myself on that. Well, when I do. But let's say if I don't, if I did it. I wouldn't care, only because of the fact that I pursued the one reason why I got into magic, putting smiles on other people's faces. Houdini was the one to come along and take magic from a grand stage illusionist to a cool guy that you know people wanted to emulate. Back in the day, believe it or not, you look at Houdini now and you don't think anything like that, but Houdini was the Justin Bieber of that time. He was a sex seller. Um, he was selling sex to everybody that, he, believe it or not, he was a stud for back then. Um, everybody wanted to be like Houdini. Houdini changed the game when it came to modern magic in that all these different elements 
of magic came together as one. He first started billing himself as the king of cards. Houdini started out with uh, vaudeville performances, doing random sleight of hand close-up stuff, then billed himself as the king of cards. Then he got into escapes and then became a movie star. So once you can tackle becoming a movie star and making whatever it may be cool, it doesn't matter what it is. If you're the best at it, you change the game. You know, you you want it doesn't it could be juggling, it could be dancing. If you're the best at what you do, you're gonna leave a mark that nobody's gonna forget for hundreds of years. When you have a, a, a job, you're staring at the clock all day. When you have a career, when I'm here, the day flies by. It's like five o'clock now. The day flew by. I have a ton of stuff to do. There's not enough time in the day, but as long as you're going to work and doing what you love, that's what matters. So you can make money being a magician. We make money here in the shop, giving tours, doing lectures, selling magic, selling magic to other magicians, showing magic, doing shows. But um, street magic, busking, is a big thing out here. Times Square is right up the block. You know, that's the mecca, the center point of everything in the world is Times Square. It's gonna go right here, back in the middle, just like that. Okay. Give it a snap. Blow. It actually makes the card a little colder than the rest. Of it. Now I did make this; it, it, it's tweaked from the original version of it. But what was the card that you chose? So that's, that's the card that you signed right there. How about this? We're gonna put this about right there, okay? That way I, I can't touch it. And I'm gonna choose a card for myself. Initials and what about this a smiley face? Two. One, two. Look at the card there. Well, uh, one of the things that people call Harry Houdini was the great liberator because he made feel people. He made sorry. He made people feel like they were free from. The trouble. He made people forget how how bad things were. That's why one of the things that he was called is the great liberator. He was able to make people feel uh, good about their life. Now magic's dying down, and it's not the same that it used to be. Um, nowhere near as the same it used to be back then. Now, now you have people doing magic with. They're doing camera tricks, you got people doing magic with Rubik's Cubes, you got people doing magic with um, watches, their shoes, their hair, their glasses, clothes itself. It's crazy because I can't say that no one's ever learning anything new because everything that's being taught has already been taught for years now. People are just taking and putting their little twist to it. It's like nothing's changing. And like I said, it's going to die down and magic's not going to be the same. The more it's about, it's about making a connection with another human being. It's far more important for me, like, like for example, if I have five minutes with, with another human being, I would rather try and make a connection with that human being rather than trying to fool them. Um, I mean, if I can do both, it's great, but making the connection is more important for me now, I think. Magic is a great way of of making somebody feel better. Like, maybe they don't even know that they're having a bad day, but if you can just bring them from here to here, you know, it's, I'm supposed to be doing a service for you, not not to like, ta look at me. It's, it's not what it's about. I mean, kind of, but not really. It's not anymore, not for me. Now it's about. Um, if I can make you feel better about yourself by, by showing you a trick, great. Because not only that, it makes me feel better, knowing that somebody walks out elevated. I think elevated is a good word. Um, I'll give you a brief example. The other day, somebody came into the shop, a woman from, from Mexico. And I, I look at it, and I can tell something was bothering her. So I, I borrowed a coin from her. She wrote her name on it. 
I put it back into her hand and she squeezed her hand and when she opened her hand, the coin was bent. Right? Very easy trick, a lot of my sisters were doing, but, but I, I didn't want to do it like, ooh, look, it's bent. So I, I said, look, I know there's something bothering you. When you go home today, I want you to remember that you have inner strength and that, that inner strength is in you the whole time. And whenever you feel like you're powerless or, or weak, I want you to pull that coin out of your, out of your pocket or your purse and remember this day. Remember this day when I reminded you that you are a powerful human being. And I truly believe that when she left here, she, she came from here and, and, and left feeling elevated um, over something very simple but deeply emotional. So, yeah, um, magic isn't about fooling people. It's about creating mystery. And it's about creating that, what I believe to be a real, a real mystery in life, that connection between uh, me and you.